Okay. Uh, I was asked by the powers that be, the very important powers that be, to introduce uh, Lynn June today. And nothing would give me greater pleasure than introducing Lynn June um, because she's one of the most remarkable scientists I've ever had the privilege to work with. And I first met Lynn June when um, she was asked by her then PhD boss to do some work with us on MALDI, on STG ganglia and cells. And then Lin Jun came to the lab for a very short postdoc before um, getting, moving on to uh, her in own independence. And Lin Jun, as you all know, um, has pioneered new techniques for analyzing neuropeptides. She has done a phenomenal amount of work characterizing the neuropeptides in crustacea and other animals and probably every animal known to person along the way. And what I've always admired about her, she's invariably cheerful. She's extraordinarily hardworking. And somehow that she maintains her cheerfulness, her responsibility and her attention to detail while being extraordinarily prolific and productive. And so she's to my mind, one of the most remarkable scientists I've ever had the, the privilege and happiness to work with. And so Lin Jin, go for it. She seems to have disappeared, but I don't see her. She was here. Could I, how about right now? Go, yes, now you're back and now you have to share your screens. No, I don't see my PowerPoint for some reason. But we saw it before. Yeah, right. I don't know what's up with that computer. I'm so sorry. Um, it was, yeah, it was showing here. Well, what you'll see in Lynn June's background, I can tell you, is summer in Wisconsin. So it just gives you a sense of what we can all look forward to while she hunts. She did show us her screen before. Can you see, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. There you are. All right, you can see me and can see the slides. I can see your slides, which is most important. All right, great. Um, well, um, so Eve, thank you for that so generous introduction. And also thank you, Nelly and Smita for organizing this uh, event and also for giving me this opportunity to share with you some of our work. I, this is actually a community that I really draw a lot of inspiration for our research. I thought I will start out with a minute brief introduction of our uh, lab. So we started uh, back in 2003. So far we have graduated 54 PhD students. Currently uh, we're um, training 27 graduate students for postdocs and a few undergrads. Um, and some of our research can be, um, you can follow us on Twitter or, or our um, a lab website. I thought I would spend a minute to just briefly talk to you about some of the work that we, uh, our lab is interested. We started out with actually a crustacean lab doing a lot of method development, like uh, Eve was saying. And during this process, we have developed and expanded our area of application uh, to, for example, during this process, we became very interested in mass spectrometry imaging. So we apply this technique to also look at uh, biomarkers in uh, a variety of cancer and also developing the chemical tags for high throughput quantitative proteomics and lipidomics for Alzheimer's disease, and also a variety of different uh, mass spectrometry techniques such as eye mobility and glycan analysis coupled with uh, capillary electrophoresis uh, with all of these different uh, mass spectrometers. But today my main goal is to tell you about our uh, major, the most important research endeavor that is focusing on studying and discovering neuropeptides in the crustacean model system. And for this audience, probably I don't need to tell you too much about how important neuropeptides, so the, these are among the most diverse and complex 
uh, intercellular signaling molecules. So cartoonly depicted here, the blue and orange neurons. And when the nerve impulse arrived at the tip of this axon of the blue neurons, so these tiny green sacs that are packaged with neuropeptides and neurotransmitters can release their chemical content, diffuse across the thin gap and uh, elicit secondary response. So during this biosynthetic uh, pathway for this uh, neuropeptides, you recognize from neuropeptide gene transcribed to messenger RNA to this large inactive prepro hormone, oftentimes three, 400 amino acid residue long, and they undergo actually a series of complex proteolytic processing with different kind of uh, enzymes, and they, um, chop it into smaller pieces and then undergo actually post-translational modification. And so this process basically suggests that even if you know the neuropeptide gene, oftentimes it's hard to predict the final bioactive peptide. So we need to use biochemical tools in our lab using mass spectrometry to determine the precise exact chemical structures, so the primary amino acid sequence. And also along the way, we also need to know where spatially these neuropeptides are expressed and localized. So traditional ways to do this is antibody-based immunohistochemistry. Our group has been using mass spectrometry imaging to help localizing these uh, neuromolecules. And complementary to that, uh, we also developed in vivo microdialysis and also quantitation strategies. But for this community, and this is one of the, uh, the central um, really goal of this particular model system is there's so much electrophysiology work done with this uh, wonderful model that you can really probe peptide activity at the single cell in neural circuit level. So this, uh, for this particular group of people, this is um, the premier model system to study neuromodulation um, in started pioneered with Eve and many others. And uh, as you, uh, in our group, we've taken uh, some of these model systems showing here, cancer borealis and blue crab calinactus sepidus. But common to all these crustacean model systems is this very well-defined uh, neural circuit uh, known as either the pyloric or the gastric mill. And what is fascinating is that uh, from animal to animal, you can reproducibly identify these uh, individual neurons and neural circuit and record their electrical activity at the single cell and circuit level. And for me, as a bioanalytical chemist, what really attracted me is this very colorful diagram highlighting some of the neurotransmitters and uh, neuromodulators, the, the molecular players utilized by the small system. Uh, obviously each of these colored lines represent a particular neurochemical modulators. And uh, some of these obviously are conserved from crab all the way mammal uh, to humans, such as acetylcholine, dopamine, GABA, nitric oxide, but also this large array of neuropeptides. And many of these peptides are previously identified using antibody-based approach and may not have the exact chemical structure for the endogenous uh, peptide uh, structures. So our group, and when I started out, I really wanted to be able to develop the strategy to help us to uh, get a collective description of the full complement of these crustacean peptidome. Because you only, uh, you really need to know the full uh, molecular players to really truly understand the model system. Obviously, uh, this is a wonderful model and um, this is just highlighted from some of the earlier work in this community where, you know, with the very same neural circuit by different neuromodulators such as serotonin, dopamine, or these different ephemeramide peptide, cardiac active peptide, red pigment concentrating hormone, you can really con reconfigure and generate vastly different functional output. So this is a wonderful model to, um, you have very well characterized network, well-defined physiology. However, it's also richly modulated. So for analytical chemists, this presents a great opportunity, but also a lot of challenges and highlighted here a few of them. So many of these neuropeptides are active at very low abundance. So we're talking about atomal to femtomal amount. And also many neuropeptides exist in super large 
families, and I'll highlight some examples. And also for mass spectrometrists, currently we don't have a fully sequenced genome. I know that uh, a few months ago, Dave gave a great presentation about some of the transcriptome effort, and also people like Andy Christie, Patsy Dickinson, and others have utilized uh, transcriptome information to map to help to uh, accelerate the process for uh, this neuropeptide discovery. And also, as I've shown you from that biosynthetic uh, pathway, that many of these neuropeptides are naturally processed. We don't necessarily know the identity of these enzymes. So that means we have very highly variable C-terminal and very extensive uh, post-translational modifications that will highlight a few. And also compared to very extensive and advanced electrophysiology study, prior to mass spec, there was actually very little biochemical analysis. But the advantage is that for any new peptides that we discover, we can synthesize them and probe their physiological actions at the single cell and net network level. I know I bother Eve a lot for uh, testing some of our novel peptides and, and also Mikey and, and others. So since this talk is going to uh, show a lot of mass spectrometry data, instead of showing you all these different uh, fancy mass spectrometers, I thought I would actually just kind of uh, summarize some of the key uh, information that we can obtain from mass spectrometry measurements, especially in the context of neuropeptides. Um, so there are really two level of information that we're getting. One is the mass to charge ratio. So these are getting the intact molecular weight or mass of peptides. And the other information is through so-called tendon mass spectrometry, so MSMS, to fragment these peptide backbone along this backbone to generate sequence-specific fragment ions we call de novo sequencing. So highlighted here is one example. Uh, it's a mass spectrum, uh, like an artificial mass spectrum. And let's say that we're interested in this red peak among this mixture. We can isolate this and subject this uh, precursor ion to low uh, energy collisional induced dissociation. So showing here is one generic uh, peptide uh, structure. So we can primarily this low energy CID cleave this COMH AMI backbone and generate the fragment ions either retained at the amino site, so that's so called B type fragment ions, or the charge retained at the carboxy uh, site is so called Y type fragment ions. So if we're lucky, we get a consecutive ion series. So the adjacent peak correspond to a mass difference of a single amino acid. So here we can read out amino acid sequence, essentially like a gas-based Edmund degradation. So uh, with that general information uh, in mind, um, over the past decade or so, we have developed several sampling strategy to help us discover neuropeptides. And two of these are uh, direct tissue analysis or in situ analysis, where we could start out with um, animal dissection, isolate specific ganglion of interest, put them on a metal plate, encode it with matrix, and then we can irradiate, uh, irradiate with laser beam to generate this kind of a molecular fingerprint. And each of these correspond to putative neuropeptides. And if we desire higher spatial information, we can, uh, for example, here we can section a brain, a crab brain, and code the section with uniform layer of matrix, and then just raster the tissue across a fixed laser beam at each XY position. And then you generate this kind of array of mass spectra. And for each of the M over Z, we can reconstruct an ion density map to call this uh, mass spectrometry image. And complementary to this direct tissue analysis, we can also pull multiple tissue together, uh, grind them up to generate this very complex chemical soup that's the uh, neuropeptide extract. We can then fractionate them, run either uh, MALDI, matrix assisted laser desorption, ionization, or electrospray where it generate multiple charge ions. This would facilitate the fragmentation MS, MS that I just described. And based on this, you can uh, get the peptide sequence and perform, for example, RT-PCR to pull out neuropeptide gene. In complementary to this tissue expression analysis, we're also doing some of the microanalysis to uh, perform, to look at uh, what's being released. So with that first approach with the direct tissue profiling, if you take a piece of pericardial organ, so this is uh, an uh, endocrine organ that is near the heart and is known to produce a lot of 
peptide hormones and put it on a multi plate. So within seconds, you can get a mass spectrum like this. And because we're using high resolution mass spectrometry measurements, so these actually allows us to resolve very clearly some of these overlapping isotopic clusters to allows us to assign these different peptides based on their calculated molecular mass. So that's uh, suggesting that when we know the peptide sequence, we can calculate the, ma the, the uh, theoretical mass and uh, use the experimental match to match the accurate mass measurement. And it, this color coded suggests for different peptide families. However, a lot of the other times that we don't know the sequence, so that uh, obviously presents some challenge to de novo sequence to discover novel neural peptides. As I mentioned that we don't have a, a well-defined uh, genomic sequence or database. Um, so, and also many times the tendon mass spectrum could be very complex. And so uh, I showed you that simplified example, you can tell B type and Y type fragment lines, but in real complex situation, a lot of times it's difficult to tell that. Also, you may not have complete sequence information. And, uh, and on the other hand, also the presence of isobaric amino acid residue, for example, two glycine would weigh the same as a single asparagine or glycine alanine combination would be indistinguishable from a single glutamine or lysine. So to solve that sequence ambiguity, a former graduate student, Chang Fu, has actually uh, used this very simple chemical derivatization approach, uh, formaldehyde labeling that's uh, widely used. And so the idea is to have formaldehyde to react with primary amine of the peptide, and uh, this will form a methyl adduct after partial dehydration to form the she space. Under reducing reagent, this would actually form a more reactive secondary amine that can pick up another form aldehyde to form that dimethylated product. So the end result is basically all the N-terminal fragment ions will have this 28 Dalton dimethylation mass shift. And so this turned out to be actually quite useful for us to resolve some of the sequence ambiguity in particular at the N-terminal. For example, here we were unsure whether this is proline, alanine, or the other way around. So upon this formaldehyde labeling, we can actually tell instead of the expected 28 Dalton, we actually observe 14 Dalton. So that's a 14 monomethylation, suggests that the N-terminal is occupied by proline, which is a secondary amino acid. So this uh, uh, derivatization approach help us to uh, generate more intense fragmentation ions, but also help us to differentiate the N-terminal cyclase. Uh, so this pyroglue modified or blocked uh, which we don't observe any mass shift versus this free terminal and terminal that has 28 mass, uh, 28 Dalton mass shift. So this simple uh, derivatization help us to actually uh, de novo sequence a lot of these neuropeptides. And here shows one example of a singly charged allatostatin peptide. As you can see, the native tendon mass spectrum is very complex and lots of peaks. And even if we use the computer software, it generate all these uh, pos uh, actually false positives, uh, the wrong sequences. But upon performing formaldehyde labeling, you can see actually much simplified spectra to the point that we can do de novo sequencing. I also want to point out here, we introduced the light and heavy version, so deuterium version of the formaldehyde and this turned out to be later uh, would be useful for us to do also relative quantification when we do uh, a peptide uh, comparison. So with this simple chemistry, we were able to actually discover a large number of novel neuropeptides and all of these sequences highlighted in red are new sequences, a new peptides that we discovered using this chemistry. And I just want to, again, to point out some of these uh, conserved sequence motif, FLR, fMide, and allatostatin peptide, you know, over uh, 30 different isoforms. And so with the similar chemistry, we were able to look at some of these, for example, uh, cancer borealis to expand our neuropeptidome and uh, lobster homerus americanus, and also uh, the blue crab calinactus uh, sapidus to using this similar approach. And so then we want to also look at some of these tissue specific expression of the neuropeptide.
And so here are uh, some of the peptide distribution from based on the brain and also pericardial organ, sinus gland, and thoracic and again, for these different peptide uh, families. And here is our favorite STG, uh, esophageal ganglion, OG, and COG, again, with different neuropeptide uh, families and some of the isoforms. So with this, uh, we uh, look at the blue crab. And to further improve our identification or the coverage, we've been using both the derivatization and also two-dimensional reverse LC fractionation to improve the coverage. And this is the Venn diagram is just showed the overlap of the neuropeptides between SDG, COG, and OG. And so this allows us to map, uh, in a sense, all these different neuropeptides, categorize them into uh, 17 well-defined peptide families. And some of these um, are showing that here is the different isoforms that belong to a particular peptide family. And also these uh, showing some of the unique uh, peptide isoforms of so these numbers in parentheses showing the different isoforms that are unique for a particular tissue in the blue crab. And just to, again, showing how we actually perform these identification based on different consensus peptide family. So A-type, a lot of statin peptide, we have a uh, YXFGL amide or RF amide, uh, B-type, a lot of statin peptide, a tryptophan, six variable amino acid residues in uh, tryptophan uh, amide and also orcokinin peptide. So these are just looking at the previously identified peptides. So in order to identify some of the novel new peptides, uh, we rely on uh, increasingly more uh, some of the software that uh, has become available. For example, here, uh, based on the MSMS, we can generate these kind of uh, tendon mass back fragmentation. And um, if they match the database, we know there's this belong to the known neuropeptide. If they don't match, and then we can actually try to look for these sequence motif and also look at and calculate the average uh, local conference, uh, uh, confidence score. If it's greater than 70%, we then assign them as putative novel peptides. So these are some of the examples. Uh, this work was done by uh, a former graduate student, Sheila Liu. Uh, for example, here we can identify uh, one of the novel peptides in pyrokinin peptide that falls in this uh, sequence motif, also have a very high ALC score. And uh, the bottom shows an example of the RF amide. So obviously these are just looking at the peptide identification. Another layer of the complexity for neural peptide uh, signaling comes from post-translational modifications. And these are uh, oftentimes a little more challenging to study. And one of these uh, neuropeptides uh, or class of neuropeptides is the sulfokinin. And this is a crustacean version of the, um, uh, similar to the, the homolog of the CCK. So the, uh, the tyrosine sulfation uh, shown here, oftentimes it happened actually at low abundance and is also very labile. And this was actually um, uh, previously uh, um, suggested by, um, predicted by uh, Patsy Dickinson uh, and, and Andy Christie by just mining the transcriptome uh, in, in that case. And they've uh, then uh, predicted the, uh, the lobster version of this sulfokinin, and then they show actually that it has the increased uh, frequency and amplitude for heart contraction. However, here we actually using mass spectrometry based approach to identify this uh, a sulfur, uh, sulfokinin peptide. And so we've also done some work uh, for this in the rock crab. And so as we know, uh, for this community, probably people know that actually back in 1990, Ter uh, Gina Terrigiano published a nature paper to suggest that the CCK-like peptide is actually increased and elevated in the hemolymphs after feeding in the lobster. Uh, and they also show the increased gastric mill activities. However, for a long time, this peptide has not been actually uh, sequenced or identified. Um, so later on, this has been seen uh, extensively in the insect species. However, it was only predicted sequenced in crustacean. There are probably two work in the uh, shrimp. And, and as I mentioned, also Patsy's uh, lab work and using uh, the predicted 
form of these uh, sulfokinin to test that it actually increased the heart contraction in lobster. Because there are actually a few challenges of the sulfokinin identification using mass spec. One is the low abundance and also the label PTM. So uh, we really actually uh, trying to search for this particular uh, peptide based on this uh, unique modification. And also thanks for uh, some of the advanced instrumentation that we uh, recently acquired that allows us to actually pinpoint the, both the site of modification, tyrosine sulfation, both modified and non-modified, but also the pyroglue cyclized modified peptide and also some additional modification occurring at the methionine oxidation. So this has uh, shown, um, this was actually done with the high energy collision dissociation, as you can see that this actually suggests the sequences. However, the tyrosine sulfation uh, mo uh, modification was actually lost. So the preservation of this label uh, tyrosine sulfation occurs when we actually had a, the acquisition of this new instrument, um, a thermal uh, orbitrap fusion lumos instrument that offers a hybrid fragmentation techniques where we have both the high energy CID but also the electron transfer dissociation that uh, occurred uh, uh, cleaving the bond and preserve this more label tyrosine sulfation. As you can see here, not only we see this uh, B and Y type fragmentines, but also we can see the C and Z fragmentines where we can preserve this uh, uh, modify, modification. So we can unambiguously tell uh, where this modification occur. And as you can see, we got two different versions of these uh, sulfokinin. So the other modification I want to uh, spend a, a couple of minutes to tell you about is a very recent modification that our lab become very interested is the glycosylation. So as some of you probably know, the glycosylation is among the most ubiquitous and complex modification in protein, protein trans, uh, post-translational modification. And it can come with two different versions. One is happening at the asparagine, this end link glycosylation or it can also happen at the serine threonine, uh, so-called O-link glycosylation. And this, depending on different monosaccharide, it can come with different combinations and also linkage pattern. So it really actually has a lot of uh, chemical complexity and diversity. And it, in terms of the bioactivity, this could activate receptor and also involved in signal transduction, molecular trafficking. However, their modification in neuro, uh, neural peptides is actually uh, very recently being uh, explored in, in part because uh, these, are, um, these modifications, as I mentioned, is very diverse and also present at very low abundance. So that means it requires um, an actually enrichment strategy to help us to uh, see them. And also these glycosylated modified peptides are having lower ionization efficiency. So in order to combat that, besides the enrichment strategy, we've also been uh, exploring some of the more advanced uh, fragmentation techniques. So showing here is the uh, example of a glycopeptide, as you can see, there are a number of these different glycans attached. So with the traditional high energy CID fragmentation, we mainly actually break these uh, uh, peptide bond and also these glycans so without preserving some of these site of modification. However, with the hybrid electron transfer higher energy fragmentation, we can break this peptide bond while preserving these more label um, C, uh, uh, modification glycan site. So this, uh, so for this, we have actually exploited several different uh, uh, fragmentation strategy. One is so-called stepped collisional energy, HCD. So that means you uh, uh, like uh, sequentially increase the collisional energy and also using this oxonium ion. So when we have a uh, glycosylated peptides, it can have these diagnostic ions that can trigger the ETHCD fragmentation allows us to get the sequence information. So with all of these uh, kind of a, a lot of the hard work uh, behind and I skip a lot of the technical detail, I just want to present this one uh, kind of a summary diagram uh, done by Ashley uh, to really review some of the diversity of these glycosylated neuropeptide in the uh, cancer borealis crabs. And what you can see here, 
Um, so she actually plotted this into different neuropeptide families. So the inner circle that represents different neuropeptide families. So, so far we found 11 neuropeptide families have actually these type of glycosylation and 41 of these having uh, this uh, neuropeptide showing uh, this glycosylated, so this middle circle. And then the outer circle shows the different glycoside. And you can see there's both N-linked and O-linked glycosyl uh, glycosylation site. And so altogether, there are also 48 uh, different glycans. And so some of these at a single site, you may have multiple glycans. So all of a sudden this actually create, for example, uh, 139 total glycosylated neuropeptides. So that really adds another layer of chemical complexity or diversity. So I just kind of summarized that, you know, I've presented a lot of these different uh, identification and characterization. Oh, and Jen, can I stop you for a second? Sure. Um, if you go back to the previous slide, mm -hmm. has anybody looked at the physiological action of any of these glycosylated peptides? Not so. Not yet. Uh, that's that's one thing that uh, that's why I'm presenting to. So this is very new. Um, we found um, some of these glycosylated neural peptides. Um, we would really like. So I would say in the mammalian species, there is one uh, group, uh, Robin Pold at University of Arizona. So they've actually looked at some of these glycosylated peptide that uh, promote rat feeding. Um, so like with the, the glycoform versus the non-glyco, the glycoform shows much greater um, potency. And we have uh, also looked at another, uh, the, the uh, mouse model for diabetic, um, and we found actually O-linked glycosylated insulin. And that's also like a, kind of a, um, a differential express in those uh, obese. Uh, obese mouse. A lot of okay, somebody has to share. Yeah, okay. Okay, we can come back to this, but thanks. When Jenny is there. Did I mute myself? Okay. You're fine now. All You're right. Okay. Now. Yeah, I guess I, I was uh, muted by by the host. Okay. All right. Uh, Ling Jun, before you go on, I have a question about the glycosylation as well. Yes, please, Mikey. Um, so, just for clarity, um, are we to think that for a particular amino acid sequence for a particular peptide on this, um, for instance, on this figure? that it in the animal normally is present in both a glycosylated form and a non-glycosylated form, or is the real natural form in the nervous system the glycosylated form? And so in some cases, we've been working with a partial um, sequence, if you will. Yeah, that's a great question. So, so far, a lot of these, we found both. Um, so the, you know, as you know, man, most of these neuropeptides previously we found was none glycosylated, we already found many of them. Uh, but then, um, some, for example, some of the B-type allatostatin peptide, we found like the end link glycosylation happening at, at some of these asparagine residue and also some of the serine threonine residue that we found the O-link glycosylation. So uh, I think that it's also important to try to uh, perhaps quantify the non-glycosylated versus the glycosylated form. But this is a very kind of a recent um, discovery. So we found these peptides and then we want to see, you know, what's the relative abundance and the ratio. And, and certainly like what Eve was saying that uh, it would be very nice to look at the function, the functionality of these uh, different glycoform. And what about the stability in hemolymph? Uh, we haven't looked at a hemolymph. So this was uh, all done in tissue. Uh, I think that would be very interesting to look at because for the um, insulin, O-link glycosylated insulin is actually uh, known to increase the stability of these uh, insulin. Uh, in fact, some of the pharmaceutical companies artificially actually install uh, the O-glycosylation, for example, at the, the B chain of the insulin to increase uh, the stability or the, the half-life. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you for those great questions.
Um, all right, so to kind of summarize this part, uh, I hope I've demonstrated to you that, you know, we know that the, the small system is using a lot of these neural modulators, neural peptides. However, the mass spec based neuropeptidomic approach really has revealed much greater multiplicity of, the neuro, of these neuromodulators. And uh, this was actually without including the glycosylation. There were more than 300 novel peptides found, uh, new families, and also many isoforms. And, and uh, these numbers shown in the parentheses are just some of the uh, isoforms that we found so far. So then that bears the question why uh, so many peptides utilized by the small system is supposed to be a very relatively simple invertebrate model system. So obviously the physiologists would have different kind of questions they can ask, but from a uh, measurement point of view, we would also like to ask these three sets of questions. One is that we want to know how are these peptide isoforms belonging to the same family spatially distributed throughout the nervous system? Secondly, since these peptides are intercellular signaling molecules that need to be secreted and released in the circulating fluid, so how are these peptide isoforms degraded in circulating fluids? Do they have differential uh, sensitivity to peptidase activity and so on? And a third, perhaps more importantly, is at different physiological conditions, how are these peptide isoforms differentially expressed or secreted? So to address the first two questions, obviously we want to uh, get the spatial and also temporal information for these crustacean neuropeptide signaling. So to address the first uh, question, we uh, become very interested in mass spectrometry imaging technique, uh, just a short animation to show uh, how this technique works. So here, what you're looking at is a piece of crab brain embedded in gelatin. So we can uh, section cryostat section 10 or 12 section uh, micron uh, thin slice, and then um, define the area. And then we can uh, irradiate the laser beam at each XY position, hopefully. It will play. And um, at each XY coordinate, you generate a mass spectrum like this. You can then generate a composite uh, spectrum. Uh, looks like it's freezing. And for each XY uh, M over Z, you can create an ion density map. So even if you may not know the identity of this, you can still kind of figure out the spatial distribution of these different molecules. So we have used this technique to look at, uh, for example, the spiny lobster, Pendularis interruptus. Um, so showing in the middle are MS profiling. So you can take two discrete locations and look at their peptide profiles. So for example, you can conclude that uh, these two, pep uh, the 934-49, the tachykinin peptides are identical. However, in this brain region at this particular piece that there are multi multiple peptides that is absent from this region. So if you get want to get a more comprehensive description or spatial distribution, we do imaging mass spectrometry. So here we can see that two of the orcokinin peptide show uh, somewhat similar but a distinct a location. Severamide, same thing. We can then overlay multiple uh, species together to begin to understand potential functional interactions. And here is an example of applying this to look at the STG. Um, so here, we, again, we can use this to look at, for example, phospholipids uh, in the, uh, the nerve region and also tachykinin, some of these are alphamide and also the uh, allatostatin peptide a uh, B-type allatostatin peptide, another orcokinin peptide. So you can actually overlay uh, more uh, species together, including some of the small molecule uh, lipid species in the uh, STG. Hey, so John, yes. Can I interrupt for another question? Please. So in this imaging approach with, uh, with the laser sampling, mm -hmm. since the tissue is reasonably thick, what's the Z-axis? So how deep into the tissue are you collecting information that's a, for a run. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I wish I, I because I, I took out the 3D uh, imaging data uh, for the sake of time. So this, uh, for here, we're basically doing uh, every 10, mi 10, 12 micron. So you can do this along the z-axis. Previously, we published um, a, a 2009 paper, a 3D for the brain image. You can do like a sequential 
uh, sectioning. So then you can get this kind of a depth or Z dimension um, cool. uh, for some of the peptides. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. So, um, so, so far what you've seen these imaging experiments is largely based on accurate mass matching. And we know that for the uh, brain tissue or any tissue that's uh, very complex, so we would like to get some more uh, structural information to do MSMS. So here we rely on a different type of instrumentation. But before going that, I want to just uh, spend a moment to tell you a little bit about our um, method development in terms of uh, uh, workflow for introducing this washing step to improve the detection of neuropeptides from this uh, marine model organism. So uh, uh, the three graduate students, Amanda, Joe, and Nu, uh, worked together and they have investigated a number of these different solvent system for brief rinsing to remove the salt and also lipid interference. And they plotted this against different number of neuropeptides identified and also the uh, total ion uh, uh, chromatogram TIC normalized intensity. So based on this, they conclude that at 10 second, 50-50 water ethanol would be ideal for uh, this brief washing. And so here shows some results. Obviously, as you can imagine, after washing, you may lose some of these peptides and shown here, but you also gain a lot more other peptide for uh, uh, enhanced detection. So this uh, largely due to different size or hydrophobicity. So what's this kind of a, a method in mind or, or actually uh, the sample preparation in place? We also want to look at a little more interesting biological conditions. And one of the conditions that we chose to work to look at is the different uh, environmental stress, the hypoxia versus the hypercapnia, where we can bubble nitrogen to expel the oxygen in the water and to create this kind of different uh, level of hypoxia, mild or severe hypoxia, or uh, bubbling uh, carbon dioxide to create this kind of a ocean acidification type of condition to look at uh, basically how these different neuropeptides spatially distributed. Uh, this work was led by Amanda. So you can look at here, uh, these different condition and also different neuropep, in particular, we're targeting RFMide uh, isoforms. As you can see, oops, uh, some of these uh, different peptides are um, showing down regulation after different level of stress and others show up regulation. And this is, uh, again, another way to look at some of these uh, uh, response, neuropeptidome response to environmental challenges. So next I want to tell you about our effort of trying to get more chemical information or structural information from these imaging experiments. So again, this is our workflow after animal dissection, tissue uh, cryostat sectioning, and then we spray cold the tissue with a matrix using either automated TM sprayer or early on with the air, airbrush. And then with this hybrid, uh, instrumentation where we have the, uh, the multi source with the linear ion trap and also with uh, high resolution Orbi traps. So, this allows us to perform this uh, so called multiplex MSI experiment where we can uh, define the raster step like 150 micron and then nest it with smaller spiral step like 50 micron. So, here we can do one full MS followed by two to eight, two to nine, so eight. Uh, additional steps of targeted MS, MS. So as I mentioned, one of the challenge for mass spec imaging was only rely on accurate mass matching or this targeted MS, even though it can give you structural information is slow. So we want to do this kind of a data dependent acquisition or more automated fashion. So the idea is to sample, for example, the top three most abundant ions and perform MS, MS. And so for this type of experiment, you probably recognize that we need to have actually uh, better uh, precursor ion selection efficiency because in the brain, if you just base on abundance, then oftentimes you're dominating with these phospholipids and you're not gonna see these neuropeptide signals that kind of vary it in this region. So to uh, circumvent that problem, we have developed a pseudo gas phase fractionation techniques where we can divide these mass range to uh, three different segments. So for example, here we can do full MS followed by two MS MS, 
and then uh, do another so that to ensure that we sample these low mass region and, and so on. So this allows us to basically generate a more uh, comprehensive coverage for our peptide uh, signal range. So here we apply this to look at a COG uh, sample section and uh, showing in the bottom are three representative neuropeptide signals, um, tachykinin peptide, ochromyotropine, and the ciframide, and their ion images with both the accurate mass measurement, but also in the bottom, their sequence specific fragment ions to really support the identification. And the top is basically showing the overall results of these identification, again, color coded with different uh, family members. So to kind of summarize uh, this part of the uh, work, uh, we've used this multiplex data dependent acquisition MSI method to allow us to localize and identify these peptides at the same time. This pseudo gas based uh, separation helped to improve the precursor selection. And also this enabled us to de novo sequence some of the new peptides. And showing here is one example of a new RF amide uh, with the sequence coverage and also the MS images in the, in the brain. So all together from this, for example, 10 micron thin slice tissue, we can identify 18 novel neuropeptides. So besides neuropeptides, we are also interested actually in imaging some of the neurotransmitters or low molecular metabolites. And this creates actually a big uh, challenge because MALDI, as you know, that we use actually um, matrix compound, and this could create extensive interference because in the low mass region, and the other a challenge comes from the low ionization efficiency from these uh, neurotransmitters. And so to address this uh, challenge, we've actually uh, um, followed one of the uh, pioneer work from Pure Engine's lab. They use this uh, pyrrolium salt to basically derivatize the primary amine to install a, a, a permanent positive charge. So this would greatly improve the ionization efficiency. So here is a comparison between the matrix alone versus the derivatized tissue with matrix. As you can see, we were able to detect many more neural uh, transmitters such as GABA, dopamine, and, and some uh, serotonin. And also you can compare our sample, the brain tissue section, the GABA on tissue MS2 versus the, uh, the GABA standard. As you can see, they actually align pretty well. And then we can apply this to look at uh, the images. So here again is the matrix alone. We can detect a few of these uh, neurotransmitters such as acetylcholine, uh, some of these lipid and amino acids. Again, with the derivatization, we were able to detect many more or image many more of these neurotransmitters such as uh, GABA, some of the histamine, uh, together with dopamine and serotonin in, in DOBA. So this uh, approach basically using on tissue chemical derivatization was this, just like spraying this uh, pyrrolium salt to serve as a primary amine derivatizing uh, reagent to enhance the ionization and also the reaction free approach. So uh, the two approach together allows us to basically detect uh, many more uh, neurotransmitters. So the hopefully the future is to we, where we can co-localize some of these neurotransmitters and neuropeptides together with uh, this technique. So, so far I've talked to you mainly about how to get spatial information. And next I want to spend some time to tell you about uh, some of our effort of coupling in vivo microdialysis to probe neuropeptide secretion dynamically from uh, living crabs. So here you can see this uh, crab is eating a piece of fish. Um, and um, here we have a microdialysis probe implanted in the neuroendocrine, uh, uh, the pericardial chamber. And here is the picture of the microdialysis probe. At the tip of the probe, there's this semi-permeable membrane with certain molecular weight pore size that allow you to uh, collect neurotransmitters and neuropeptides across the concentration gradient through diffusion, and then leave behind these large clotting factors. So that can generate a cleaner sample, but more importantly, allows us to continuously sample this. So this is a cartoon to basically showing the position of the uh, dialysis probe, and we can ideally in the future can also add, for example, uh, peptide drugs or other kind of things to look at 
some of these interactions. But through this approach, we were able to discover some of the neuropeptides. And one of these is the GA, HK, HK NY, LR apamide. So we get actually these um, sequence specific fragment lines. Obviously one of the, uh, the advantage of working with a crustacean model system is we can take these novel neuropeptides once we confirm that we got the right sequence, we can synthesize them and then ship to Eve's lab for testing to see if they are actually doing something to the uh, SDNS. So here is an example basically showing that the control and then after a, a vast application of micromolar concentration, GAHK, NYLR apamide, and it really actually elicited very strong, robust uh, pyloric reason. So that shows that this peptide is active, it's doing its thing, and we got the right uh, peptide sequence. And another example is actually a, an inhibitory uh, peptide that we also discovered. So this a B type allotostatin peptide has been actually uh, long implicated in the insect invertebrates, um, and it has this C terminal sequence motif with tryptophan, six variable tryptophan am uh, amide. And so we actually, again, using the mass spectrometry, tandem mass spec approach to discover the first um, B type. ASD in, in the craft, in the crustacean, and showing the top is the real, uh, the, the PO tissue sample, and the bottom is the standards. You can again see they're very well aligned to each other. But more importantly, they're doing, they're actually having an effect on, for example, this uh, ongoing pyloric rhythm. As you can see, PD, LP, PY have the uh, rhythmic activity. Um, and then after apply this peptide, it actually shut off the, um, the rhythm activity and after washing out, um, this rhythm is restored. So that again shows another example of using this approach, we can discover peptides that have the biological, the physiological effect. So obviously this is all fine. However, in order to really further improve microanalysis sampling, uh, technique is in particular improving the, uh, the, uh, the temporal resolution, there are still some remaining challenges as we rely primarily based on the passive diffusion uh, for collecting these peptides. So there is actually a low recovery rate and that um, coupled with the high salt concentration and also the low concentration of neuropeptides, picomolar to nanomolar concentration. So we really need to further improve the recovery. So one strategy that we have been exploring is to uh, use this so-called affinity enhanced microanalysis where we can actually infuse some of these uh, magnetic nanoparticles that would conjugate with the antibody that recognize particular neuropeptide family. So basically artificially increase the transport or the concentration gradient that allows us to uh, have higher recovery rate uh, to improve uh, the sampling. So this is a comparison of using the in vivo uh, affinity enhanced microanalysis versus no uh, affinity reagent, as you can see, with this uh, using the uh, fermerfamide antibody that we were able to get uh, actually much enhanced detection of some of these FLR fermide peptide. And so this is a picture showing the, our microanalysis uh, setup. This work was done by two talented graduate students, uh, Claire Schmerberg and uh, Jidan Liang. So they were looking at, for example, the dynamic changes of neuropeptides during light and dark cycle, the circadian rhythm. And very interestingly, they actually found, for example, uh, different patterns for different neuropeptides. And uh, for CCAP, as you can see, when the light is on, there's actually a pretty sharp decrease of these peptides. Um, and also pigment dispersing hormone. Initially, we have a spike in dark, and then after that, there is actually uh, uh, reduced expression and then stayed at, the, uh, at this um, a low plateau. And then the red pigment concentrating hormone is showing a very interesting oscillating pattern for this. So again, some of these uh, analysis, we want to uh, figure out what's the physiological uh, meaning. But we, obviously we also wanted to apply this to look at, uh, for example, involved in feeding through microanalysis. As I mentioned, this allows us to shorten the sampling time. So this would allow us to look at some of the more 
dynamic changes of uh, neuropeptides. So here we're looking at FLR amide and YR amide before and after feeding. So in the remaining time, I want to also talk to you about um, you know, uh, some of our effort of looking at these uh, peptide changes or comparative neuropeptidome study in response to food intake to feeding, because we know there are a lot of literature actually suggest neuropeptides regulating feeding and also trying to understand at the feeding condition how these peptide isoforms changing their expression pattern would be quite uh, interesting. And I want to point out these uh, line of research has been carried out by several generation of uh, graduate students, starting with Raving Chen, Li Mei Hui, and recently by Kellen Delaney, and currently with uh, Wen Xin Wu. So here, uh, the general idea is pretty simple. So we look at the fed or hungry uh, crabs and then take out their uh, central nervous system or neuroendocrine organ to extract neuropeptides. And then we want to use, for example, uh, I mentioned the formaldehyde labeling, the light and heavy version. So this would generate a four Dalton mass shift for each of the peptide pair. So we can compare their relative abundance changes. And once we identify the changes, we can try to map their spatial distribution with imaging mass spectrometry. And also complementary to tissue expression, we want to look at their uh, secretion uh, or in circulating fluid or in the hemolymphs. So the early results, we basically take a brain, a crab brain, uh, label them with the light and heavy formaldehyde from this two uh, hungry and, and fat crabs. As you can see that there are a number of these peptides show uh, up regulation such as ciframide, some of these alanine, orchokinin, um, um, tachykinin peptide, and several LR epamide, but also some many others don't show changes. And so we can actually take this, for example, 25 of these peptides and group them into several peptide families and plot them and this was looking at a five different animals. And another interesting thing to look at is how these neuropeptide isoforms uh, change in different tissue, right? So that we also want to understand better the tissue specific differential expression in response to feeding. So here again, we're looking at brain, sinus gland and PO. Um, so for each of the colored dots represent a particular isoform and the ratio is the fed versus unfed for different peptide families. And if we break it down to, uh, this is looking at the brain neuropeptide sequences, we, thought we know their molecular weight. And we can look at some of these peptides show statistical significant changes and use those masses or M over Z as guide and then try to do imaging mass spectrometry. So here are some of the earlier results. We can see their RF amide that is uh, localized in the medium protocerebrum region and the tachykinin peptides is localized in the uh, olfactory lobe region. And it happens to these two brain regions actually uh, from earlier morphology study that is shown that it's actually sending projections down to uh, the feeding circuit to innovate the, uh, the feeding circuit. So that basically suggests that we can use imaging mass spec to learn more about the potential feeding regulation uh, uh, centers. So besides cancer borealis, we've also looked at blue crab. And during this process, we found a new peptide showing here the M over Z at 1026.5. And it turns out this is actually a, uh, another tachykinin peptide that was the tyrosine, uh, tyrosine occupying the N-terminal instead of the, uh, alan, uh, the alanine for the capturb. So we took this um, uh, due to de novo sequencing, and then we look at after feeding, as you can see, that both of these, uh, the tachykinin peptide, the uh, capterp, and also the casterp, uh, show upregulation. And this result is also consistent with imaging mass spec. We can compare the unfed versus fed, the 934.49, and also the blue crab version, the, uh, uh, the casterp. Uh, uh, so we then uh, uh, called uh, Mikey, and Mikey's lab have taken taken these two tachykinin peptide and look at their physiological effect and basically BAS applied both of these tachykinin peptide to see their effect on the uh, gastric mill. As you can see, uh, this uh, the blue crab version, the calsterp, uh, also activate the uh, gastric mill rhythm activity and they have actually similar 
degree of kind of activation for uh, the, the captorb. And showing on the right is uh, this, both of these peptides also activate the pyloric rhythm activity uh, of the uh, STG. So that shows, again, we have the, uh, these peptides shows uh, biological activity and can activate the feeding circuits. So more recently, we have uh, done more extensive uh, looking at these different tissue specific neuropeptide changes in, uh, in response to feeding. So here we can uh, look at again, the brain tissue, the commercial ganglion, and we're looking at a number of these different peptides and also the stomatogastric ganglion uh, of uh, several of these uh, neuropeptide sequences. But it's very interesting to know that when we also look at the neuroendocrine organ, in particular, pericardial organ, and also the sinus gland, we observe actually many more of these peptides actually show down regulation. And so that may suggest some of these peptides are secreted and released to participate uh, some of these effects. So that's, um, again, uh, another very interesting observation that we are uh, still trying to understand some of the uh, physiological consequences. But one thing that I want to point out is that within these peptide family, different isoforms, some of these have up regulation, some has down regulation. Again, arguing that the importance to look at the isoform specific level of expression uh, for regulating uh, some of the feeding behavior. So besides some of these known peptides, again, we want to look at some of the novel peptides through this uh, process, especially when the peptides show uh, differential regulation, we want to do de novo sequencing. So one of the uh, two examples that I highlighted here um, are, uh, one of these is showing the cryptocyanin peptide actually show upregulation and also another LRFMide and showing in the bottom are two um, mass spectra. So the mirror plot showing the top is from our uh, sample and the bottom is that after we determine the sequence, we can synthesize them, the reference standard to show they actually really match their fragmentation pattern. But I want to point out that through this process, we were able to uh, discover or de novo sequence uh, more than 30 different new peptides from sinus gland and, and a number of these different tissue samples for these putative novel peptides. Obviously we want to know again, what they do for this, um, you know, for the crustacean model system. So one way to assess these uh, functional analysis is to maybe look at um, their uh, effect on the cardiac neuromuscular system. So we learned this from uh, Patsy Dickinson. Um, so here, uh, the two uh, simple uh, parameters that we look at is the cycle frequency and contraction amplitude. So we took these two new peptides uh, that sequence. So um, uh, Kellen uh, took a trip to Patsy's lab and uh, learned about this um, uh, ex vivo heart physiology in preparation. So basically, she can take these peptides and vas apply them and uh, after perfusion to look at and measure the amplitude and frequency change. As you can see that in both cases, uh, this actually increased the amplitude of heart contraction. And for the LR amide, it actually increased the frequency, but in the cryptocyanin actually shows a, a modest decrease or reduction of the frequency. Uh, but both of these novel neuropeptides show some statistical significant effect on the heartbeat. So that's again, uh, showing uh, that we can utilize some of this approach to uh, assess some of the physiological function. So the, um, complementary to the tissue expression, we're also interested in looking at what's changing in the circulating fluid during the feeding. So here we are taking uh, the hemolins from unfed or immediately after feeding, 15 minutes, one hour, and two hours after feeding, uh, with this uh, mass spec workflow to both discover uh, and also quantify some of these peptides. So this shows some of the family uh, distribution of different neural peptides. As you can see, the unfed has a larger number of different peptide families, and then uh, zero, 15 minutes. And here shows some of the peptides that are only present in unfed, and here shows the uh, peptides that are present at all different time points. And the number in this is showing the different isoforms that we were able to detect with this uh, approach. So just one uh, slide to show that uh, with this uh, methodology, 
we can actually pinpoint some of these different peptides such as ASTA, uh, arafamide, or this uh, tachy uh, the um, crustacean hyperglycemic uh, uh, CPRP related hormone or cocainine and so on. So we can actually map their dynamic changes during feeding process. So in the future, we would like to actually uh, correlate um, with what uh, Mikey has been seeing. Uh, so Mikey's uh, lab has recently published a very interesting article where they uh, look at the feeding state dependent modulation. Obviously they took the unfed and fed hemolins and put it on the uh, gastric mill to look at their uh, physiological effect. So the general conclusion from their study is that only the fed, not, but not the unfed, actually has an effect for uh, some of these, uh, the motor pattern uh, changes. And this effect is also uh, time point dependent. So uh, I think in the future, it would be very interesting to correlate some of these modulation with the uh, hemolymph hormone composition in, in particular uh, corresponding to some of these timeline, uh, uh, time point study. So those are some of the uh, ongoing work. In the remaining uh, couple minutes, because I might be running uh, short on time, I just want to quickly highlight a couple other uh, physiological interaction uh, conditions that we've been looking at. One of these is to look at um, neuropeptide changes uh, during hypoxia. And here we can look at different uh, time course, but also different degree of um, hypoxia. So for example, again, using the nitrogen uh, to uh, bubble the bubbler to uh, expel the oxygen to create this different degree of um, hypoxia condition. Um, here we can look at one of these uh, conditions is to look at a 10% oxygen level so that's considered as a severe um, uh, stress condition and also the normal, uh, the mild condition. And we can compare, for example, different, again, different peptides in, in the brain tissue expression. And also in the bottom, uh, we're also doing some of the low pH stress for uh, the crabs uh, using the CO2 uh, bubbler. And this was looking at some tissue specific regulation pattern. Again, we're looking at different peptide families and also for different uh, uh, peptides under different uh, specific tissues. As you can see, there's a very interesting tissue specific uh, regulation pattern. And through this process, we can also look at hemolymphs uh, level, different neuropeptide changes in response to pH stress. And through this, we uh, were able to discover two of these novel peptides uh, where we can use the isotopic dimethylation, as I mentioned, as, as a, a chemical derivatization, not only helping the de novo sequencing, but it can also help us to perform relative quantification. So, uh, so this obviously requires a lot of uh, tank space. So we have expanded our, our aquatic system quite a bit, uh, but also we need strategies to improve our um, quantification throughput. So to that end, we've been developing strategy to improve our multiplexing. So basically the idea is that can reduce the sample amount from any one sample, reduce the sample preparation time, but also allows us to look at many biological conditions in a single experiment. So toward that end, we've been developing a set of um, isobaric chemical tags uh, highlighted here as the dimethylated leucine. So the general idea is that we can react with primary amine with this uh, triazine ester. And here we have a balance group, the carbonyl group, and then the dimethylated leucine. Um, so the idea is to incorporate different stable isotopes to create a set of, in this case, a set of fourplex identical chemical tags. So we can basically label the four sets of samples, combine them in a mass spectrometer, and each of the peptides will show as a single peak, so there's no spectral complexity. However, the, uh, the quantification happens at a seven stage, MS2, where we cleave these two bonds to generate reporter ions just one dozen apart from each other. We can relative quantify them, and then the backbone fragmentation still allows us to identify them. 
So uh, we have actually tested this uh, fourplex dilute labeling scheme with a, uh, a recent study of a copper, looking at a copper toxicity, because we know that copper is an important nutrient. However, when it's at higher concentration, it creates actually a toxic uh, a uh, stress condition. So we want to, again, look at the neuroendocrine expression, in particular, neuropeptide changes. So we can basically take these different uh, copper exposure time course with this fourplex dilute, combine them in a mass spectrometer and do MSMS for fragmentation to quantify them. So this is the result. We can take this approach to look at these different time course and look at uh, different tissue expression, thoracic, pericardial organ, sinus gland, and brain. There are a lot of these uh, different neuropeptides, but I just want to point out one uh, interesting finding. So for example, here we observe the pigment dispersing hormone that's downregulated uh, in all time points in the sinus gland. However, it's upregulated in the brain. So again, this shows uh, the tissue specific uh, uh, regulation in particular, this may correspond to the secretion and the brain is uh, um, signifying some of these upregulation. So to kind of wrap up uh, what I've talked to you today, I hope I've shown you that we've developed a multifaceted approach where we can use these um, isotopic chemical labeling to improve uh, the novel sequencing to discover novel neuropeptides and also incorporate mass spec imaging to gain spatial information in vivo microdialysis to follow the temporal dynamics. And also these isobaric isotopic labeling allows us to look at a great variety of different uh, biological conditions such as feeding, hypoxia, stress towards more functional uh, study or discovery of neuropeptides. Obviously, ideally, we want to couple any of these to physiology, electrophysiology study to really understand how these peptide signaling at the neural circuit level. So with that, I want to uh, close to thank uh, a lot of uh, the people, um, certainly people in my group um, that I highlighted, this is um, highlighted here in red are uh, people, I talked some of their work and also the current uh, lab group that highlighted in red are um, working with uh, CRAB or neuropeptide related work and also um, Tremendous thank for our FTG collaborators, in particular, Eve, Mikey, Patsy, Andy, and, and Deb for that we have uh, multiple joint publications together. I learned so much from each of our collaborators and funding, uh, but also most importantly, I'm really grateful for this community I draw uh, uh, inspiration from, from interacting with uh, this community from uh, the start of my career. Um, in particular, Eve for the wonderful mentorship, support, and friendship, and Mikey for our uh, ongoing collaboration. And I believe this picture was taken uh, back in 2010, uh, the SFN meetings. This is a, a, a Brandeis alum uh, gathering. Hopefully before too long, we can have another chance uh, to do in-person gathering again. Uh, also, I thought it might be fun to show a collection of some of the uh, cover art from our group that I feel like uh, it's really actually uh, proud to bring this wonderful model system, uh, crab crustacean model system to the world of analytical chemistry, mass spectrometry. Uh, this become a, a favorite model system. Uh, um, so I want to share uh, some of this. And, and most importantly, I also think uh, it's a tremendous uh, honor to be interacting with this great group of people. Um, so I learned so much from you and thank you all very much for the opportunity to speak to, to you today. Thank you. I'm not sure if I have any um, time for questions. Hopefully I didn't go too much. Should I stop sharing so that I can see everybody? So on behalf of everybody, Thank you so much. And I have a trillion ideas and questions. I'm so sure other people will. So um, I guess I will start out on behalf of everybody and say, what do you think the most interesting um, set of physiology experiments would be for your community to do to take advantage of what you've recently found. <laughs>
So I think um, there are a few things. I think obviously one is this uh, hemolymph study. I think I mentioned about um, correlating some of the, the chemistry, the, the, uh, the composition with some of the physio state dependent physiology modulation. And also I think the uh, imaging mass spectrometry is another area that we um, now have better instrumentation that um, hopefully down the road that allows us to look at, uh, really looking at a single cell uh, type of uh, image. So we can do some single cell with lipids because lipids are everywhere and they're easy to ionize, but neuropeptides is still a challenge. Ideally, I like to see, for example, some of these um, co-localization, co-expression of these neuropeptides and neurotransmitters in, in those kind of things. And then the other bigger thing, as I mentioned, is this uh, glycosylated neuropeptides. It's very, very interesting. I would be very curious to see if it does, um, you know, like for example, for the STG, for these different um, system, your circuitry, uh, what kind of, you know, activity that it can bring, uh, or it, uh, you know, it, it could be enhancing or, could, or have different type of effect. Yeah, and, um, and I guess the other thing in my mind is that a lot of these, uh, I think the current physiology study is still one peptide at a time. Um, and obviously in the, in the animal, in hemolymphs, they, or it, just in general, they are constantly bathed with so many different peptide modulators and peptides um, in, in this community has done a lot of work on you know, figuring out convergency and, and all these different things. I'd be very curious to see even a collection of some of these, um, a panel of these different peptides, if, if it does anything different from like on the, the is it a combined um, effect or is there like a separate effect on these neural circuitry? But I think there are a lot of unanswered questions. So I think, um, I think probably people have tons of questions for you. I'm gonna to have to leave in about 10 minutes because I have a, a phone call from Washington coming in. It's very funny. So, but everybody else can keep asking questions for the near B and, and you and I should talk soon because yeah. I have some ideas about specific things that we can look at. So- Yeah, you, you joining Eve, this is a tremendous honor and, and pleasure to see you. Yeah, I, I always got so much uh, great so ideas. I from talking yeah. to you, yeah. I see hands. Marie has her hand up. Yes, please. Thank you. Thanks for the amazing talk. Um, I'm curious. Have you any? Uh, have you looked at long term, or ha has anything jumped out in terms of long term, like annual fluctuations, any neuropeptides that are there in March and April, but not the rest of the year, or um, something on, along those lines? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. The seasonal changes, um, I think, and even just animal to animal variation, uh, I think that's another thing that we want to look at. Uh, but I, I would say sometimes, you know, we see these peptide variability, whether this come from a uh, different batch or different seasonal. We haven't looked at uh, too much of these, some of the hormone uh, changes. I think that may be, um, I think it would be very interesting to look at. Uh, but we don't have, I guess the short answer is we don't have systematic um, like a data to really um, look support that. But I suspect that would have a, a definitely play a role in some of the variation that we observe. Thank you. Oh, hey, you have your Angel? hand. Hi. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, have you ever measured the release of neuropeptides in the STG? after decentralization? I mean, oh. is there any remaining, or, or do you have a resolution to actually detect, detect that? Is there any remaining release once we actually block that STN? We all assume so, but mm. nowadays we have fewer and fewer differences between the so-called intact system and the decentralized. Yeah, system. we have not looked at, I guess when I was in Eve's lab, we did a little bit uh, release a study and at that time the instrument sensitivity and, and there are also some other issues, but now I think we might be able to look at some of the, I think that would be very interesting to explore. That's definitely something to, uh, it, again, pushing the sensitivity uh, yeah. with 
would make a big difference to to be able to, to see some of those. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, I'll write to you. Thank you. Yeah, yes, please. Yeah, you can send samples or something that we can definitely. Okay, do. let's talk about it. Yeah. Mike? I've got two questions. Oh, I, I saw you on um, there. I saw, okay, you're, you're the beautiful crab, red claws. <laughs> yeah, I, my microphone's working only on one computer, but I want to look at the other computer because it's a bigger screen. <laughs> All right. So um, question number one is something that continues to kind of boggle my mind is the ridiculously large number of isoforms of some of these peptides. Mm -hmm. And I was curious whether you or anybody else has found a comparable diversity in any non-crustacean nervous systems? Um, that's a good question. I think um, from the degree that we have looked, I, I would think crustacean has probably the largest number of these isoforms, for example, the elatostatin peptide and those, but RFMide in mammalian, you can, but they actually categorize in several different uh, bigger subcategories. So they may not seem as many, but if you look at all the RFMide, I think that the same similar kind of complexity probably also occur in the mammalian system. Previously it was not shown or suggested that, uh, that level of complexity. I think that in part because of the, the analytical instrument and, and the methodology is not quite there. But um, there is also the theory saying that, uh, for example, this huge um, complexity or the isoform uh, multiplicity is also being seen, for example, in C. elegans, in some other invertebrate systems. So there is this theory saying that the simple nervous system or the invertebrate model system, they may require this high level of um, the chemical uh, modulators to really compensate some of these simplicity of their um, nervous system. I don't know if it's completely true, but that's that, because we've done better chemistry than they have. Yeah, I think that's bogus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and right. when, when they start doing chemistry as well as you're doing chemistry, they'll see the same thing. Yeah, I think that's a general rule for them. But my, my, my other unrelated question is something you and I have discussed for many years, which is um, one of the ch challenges in this work, especially in the hemolymph, is determining the actual concentration of these various peptides. Yes. So, so that we could have a better way of, or more appropriate way of doing physiology with concentrations that are relevant to the animal. And so I was wondering if you've given any recent thought to um, approaches you could use that would be less labor intensive than the ones we've talked about in the past to get at those concentration levels? Yes, um, that's a great question. Um, again, because of the interest of time, I took out some of our uh, other strategy, which is uh, using, for example, isotopic version of dimethylated leucine. So I, I introduced the isobaric version, but the isotopic meaning that you don't have to um, have the isotope encoded standards. In other words, you, we can actually basically create a four plex, four point uh, calibration curve that allows us to determine the absolute concentration of the peptides. So, so that's the uh, one strat. We have been using that to look at some of our um, biomarkers in the cerebral spinal fluid in, in AD Alzheimer's disease patients to absolutely quantify. So I think the similar strategy can be utilized for the hemolymphs, uh, like some neuropeptide uh, quant absolute quantification. I think that would be very useful. You and I need to talk very soon. <laughs> yes, I'll, yeah, we can talk more, right? Yes, absolutely. I think that would be a good, good approach to do it. Don, good. yeah. Hi, Dawn. Um, myself. Hi. Um, I, I was wondering about the the antibodies that you're um, using in the in vivo sampling and mm -hmm. what the limit is on how many of them you could use simultaneously and how that might interfere with detection of other things at the same time. Yeah, that's a that's a wonderful question. So first of all, that antibody we actually use the polyclonal. So that, uh, for this type of work, actually, it's better because it can capture more isoforms. Um, and also you can use 
multiple. Um, I think that's that's a very interesting idea. We I actually thought about trying to use multiple antibodies, but we haven't. Uh, but theoretically, this should be possible because our um, instrument should have enough resolution to really see some of these. Um, yeah, so I mean, if, if you have something in mind, maybe we can work together or try uh, to look into that. Yes. Okay. That'd be That's very great. Interesting. Yeah, I think. Thanks I'll... for the great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Dirk. Hey, sorry if you had already addressed it. I, my Zoom crapped out a couple of times along the way. Um, I, this goes back to what Mikey has said, actually, but not just about isoforms. And uh, maybe this is, this is a discussion for everyone that we had already a bunch of times. But so we have some explanations why it makes sense to have a ton of neuromodulators to, you know, do different things with the system. Mm -hmm. Some more hand wavy than others. But, um, you know, I don't see how any of the things that we think about this applies. I mean, you know, that explains why there's 20 different neuromodulators, but not why there are hundreds of, of different ones. And I just want to get a sense from you if you have any sort of either functional physiological idea or maybe just from the chemistry and how they're produced by different descending neurons and in different places and things like that. Why the hell are there hundreds of those? I, you know, yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. That's a great question. I think then, well, the nature uh, create these large diversity. I think in part, you know, there's uh, some people said this is like compensatory mechanism, but in general, I would say this would allow, for example, and, and that's one missing piece of the, the crustacean um, neural chemistry work is that we don't, at least at this point, have much information about a lot of the receptors of GPCRs. And the G-protein couple receptor, if, if there is a single type of receptor and they may have these large variety of different isoforms, they bind to different, with different affinity. And they can, uh, I think in, in some way you can think about this is like a fine tuning the neural circuit to have, you know, that's how you have this kind of a extraordinary flexibility or, or neuromodulation. Um, so I think obviously- Is it though? Sorry to interrupt, but is no, it though? I mean, that was sort of my point, right? The extraordinary flexibility that comes with having a bunch of neuromodulators and all the co-modulation, you don't need hundreds of that. I mean, there is not that much flexibility that the system isn't tuned to, you know, make a difference of like half a spike or something. Yeah, like that. That, well, that just doesn't make sense to me that it's hundreds. It makes sense to me that it's 20 and, and all the different com combinations. But. Uh, no, I, I, I'm the opposite. I think the, the more the merrier. <laughs> well, no, the, but I, I think the just, um, uh, how do I say that? And, and also the processing, right? So, so from the, the processing, if you, from a pre pro hormone, they can have, like, can encode multiple copies of these. And sometimes uh, one form, so they can regulate one form would have uh, like a few, a few fold more than the others. As we all know that this relative abundance could, is also important. There is like a certain threshold or uh, these. And also for physiology, there's, it's already known that you have different frequency of stimulation, there are a subset of these neuropeptides uh, released. Some of these are like a higher uh, stimulation frequency that you release this pod or versus the other. I think this does convey uh, some, you know, or giving um, the animal the flexibility to, to do things. But um, I, I think there's, uh, it is real. It is, um, but again, trying to understand the functional consequence, it's, it's an ongoing challenge. And that's, that's part of, because, you know, then why, you know, you can ask for different, different conditions, why you have these different isoforms, some are uh, up or some are down regulated, they're, they're doing different things. Um, some of these, we probably don't have the tool or really the level of resolution to probe because they could be at the single cell or the, this adjacent Neurons might be using a different subset of these modulators or neurotransmitters doing this thing. So, but so there isn't even any hint that different isoforms have different affinities to the receptors or anything like that. Right. Yeah. That's that's for sure. Yeah. 
thank you for that great question. That's something I, you know, like to think about. It's frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> Keep us employed. <laughs> The other questions? All right, looks like everybody's satisfied. We have all the questions answered. And thank you very much. It's about three or two already. It was great.